Hello everybody, welcome to my channel and welcome to the very much awaited bench desk prep video. I know I promised it a long time ago, like actually maybe years, but uh, for obvious reasons I was very busy. So now I finally actually found time to film some bench test footage for you. So we're gonna talk about that today. This is how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna break it in two parts. Today I'm gonna talk about the basics and about the general prep and how it's gonna look. And in the second video of this series basically I'm gonna make I'm gonna actually prep the tooth and show you guys how I do it uh, I'm gonna do this because for me when I was sitting for bench test it wasn't that actually very useful to watch other people prep because you just watch it for a long time you don't really see what's going on so I don't think that's very helpful but actually watching the dimensions and hearing the explanation was the most helpful so we're gonna start with that Today, the first prep I'm gonna do is class two. If you don't meet it on your bench test, I, you will most certainly meet it on your CDCA. This is most loved prep of every school. Most likely you're gonna meet it on one or all of your bench tests where you're going. So let's start talking about how to actually prep a good quality type two prep. So sometimes on bench tests, they will tell you that you will, they will want you to prep and fill uh, type two preparation type 2 cavity, whatever, um, most of the time they will just tell you to prep because if your prep is good, your, your filling will be holding on well. The material of the filling does not matter. Sometimes they will tell you to prep for amalgam, sometimes they tell you to prep for composite. Uh, there are slight differences, but they're very subtle. Generally, for bench test purposes, I would not worry about that. I would prep identical for composite and for amalgam. Uh, some people will judge me for it, but uh, this isn't your video. On bench test, they're not really judging you for how professional you are in knowledge of amalgam and composite. Bench test is a screening test. They're just trying to separate people who do not know how to hold a handpiece. So if your prep is just cohesive, good shaped, logical you will pass so this is why we're not going to take talk much about the differences between amalgam and composite we're going to just slam it all together into class two prep and just learn how to make a good product so first thing you're going to do to prep a class two prep you're going to take a 330 burr why 330 burr of course you can prep with anything you like and whatever works in your hands but i recommend 330 burr especially if you're a beginner or you don't really know how to prep that well i know i didn't so 330 burr the length of the shank of the burr is actually a millimeter and a half and that's exactly the depth that you need for this prep there are two ways to kind of go about it. You can start with the box or you can start with the actual occlusal part of the prep. It does not matter. Uh, I start with the occlusal part of the prep and then drop the box. Some people I know start with the box because that's kind of the most worrisome part. I recommend starting with occlusal um, part of the prep and I will show it to you in the next video exactly the technique of how I'm prepping it. But uh, it's usually easier to break that contact wall when you are starting with, uh, when you are actually having already prepped some of the occlusal part. So what are you gonna do first? You're gonna take your 330 burr and you're gonna make a depth cut of the entire length of the burr. That's why this burr is so amazing. Plus the 330 burr has converging walls so it's gonna make this convergent side of your prep which is exactly what we're aiming for. It's an ideal burr for this prep. So you're gonna put this burr to its depths. So what are we looking depths wise in class 2 preparation? or any preparation realistically. You're supposed to have at least, at least 0.5 millimeters, so half a millimeter everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Sometimes the floor slopes and you think you got yourself a good depth, but you don't, but at some points you don't. So you actually have to take your explorer and measure every single wall at every single point to make sure it's at least 0.5 millimeters. Because if it's composite, it's probably gonna be more forgiving, but if it's amalgam, it's just gonna crack. So your preparation is not gonna support a good filling, so technically you are not proficient with your skills. If it's CDCA, you would have failed. Bench test is a little easier. They're just gonna probably not put you in the top list of candidates. I wouldn't think uh, for bench test that will be a critical fail, but I would definitely try to avoid that because it's an easy fix. You can just make it deeper. Um, the other uh, opposite of the depth wise is three millimeters. You can make it as deep as three millimeters, which is huge. Like when you, it sounds three millimeters like not that, that much but when you actually look at the prep that's ginormous so you have a lot of wiggle room with that uh, depth of that 
preparation. So 1.5 millimeters is ideal, perfect, perfection. That's where you're aiming for. And that's exactly the depth of your 330 burr. You don't even have to have your, your explorer or your probe with you. You don't have to like measure particularly. If you have that 330 burr, which is why I love it, you can just put it without activating it, of course, everywhere in every single part of your prep and see if the shank of the burr is, or the active part of the burr is exactly the height of the lengths. You did a good job. Pretty much that is all you need to know. Another critical part of the preparation is isthmus. Uh, isthmus is the connection of the box to the occlusal part of the filling. And isthmus needs to be at least one millimeter for a very simple reason. If it's an amalgam filling, the smallest plugger is not gonna fit. It's the smallest plugger diameter is one millimeter. So if you're gonna make an isthmus that's too small and the plugger is not gonna fit in there, so you're not gonna pack your amalgam in there. So again, your filling is not efficient. You're not gonna put a good quality filling in there. Try to aim for at least one millimeter. I usually like to make them a little bigger than one millimeter, but so your good criteria to measure if you're going too big, it should be about one third of the entire width of the tooth. If it's bigger than one third, mm -mm, you've gone too big. And remember, it's always better to go smaller than bigger. So don't try to whack it open. Um, it's better to just kind of stay on a smaller side. And if it's too small, you can expand it. A lot of courses and a lot of video talk about the S curve. Like you're supposed to shape uh, the isthmus part that goes into um, the box in a very intricate S shape uh, way. I don't particularly care about S curves as long as the prep is cohesive and it flows nicely. Particular presence of S curve is not gonna make or break you. So I wouldn't thrive to make an S curve. Actually, if you uh, try too hard to make that S curve, you are gonna probably sacrifice the width of your isthmus. So it's better to shave it down a little bit and make don't make it so prominent. Um, some schools love the S curve and they're very obsessed about it. My school was not and I went to BU, and I think they're very good at prepping teeth. So this is how I'm gonna teach you. Do not uh, try your best to get that perfect S-curve. Your prep will be just fine without it. Once we're done prepping that occlusal part of your preparation, we're gonna have to drop that box. And what is important about the box? Uh, its depth does not really matter. There's no particular size of the box and what is the correct size the box should be, but the contact between two teeth needs to be broken. And how do we know the contact is broken? You're gonna go down as far as, as until you see a tiny, tiny separation between two teeth. You're supposed to see the pink of the gingiva. And it shouldn't be too big. It should be just passing the explorer. Again, if it's a little bit bigger than that, if you see a wider opening that you would like to, no big deal, but the big mistake is this giant big hole. That usually happens when you didn't algulate your burr correctly, um, which I will talk uh, more about in my future videos. The walls of the box should be converging, so that's more are gonna be related to your amalgam prep because you're trying to hold up amalgam in that um, preparation that you just created, so it kind of locks it in and it doesn't separate it up. It's not as important for composite. I mean, I would thrive, even if you're prepping for composite, I would thrive for slightly converging walls, so not like this, but kind of like this. Um, so you will still, it's still a standard. It's a gold standard of preparation. So this was, this is what I'm going to be, um, teaching you. I would re advise you to do, um, the other part of composite and amalgam preparation, the angle of the preparate of the box should be 90 degrees to the cavo surface of the filling. That is very important. So you can't have your box to be way too open. And, um, especially if it's a premolar area, then your filling will be visible to the world when a patient smiles and especially if it's amalgam that's gonna be really ugly this is why that would not be a good preparation for a filling uh, so it should be 90 degrees to the tooth uh, to the surface of the tooth and uh, it doesn't matter amalgam usually um, composite usually allows a little bit more opening so it's gonna be a little more open as a martini glass but I would still uh, aim for a 90 degree angle. Another very important part is just smoothness of the preparation. If it's all choppy and cut, it's just not gonna look good. And it does, it's not necessarily gonna hurt the longevity of the restoration, but it's just not gonna look as good, which, you know, we all meet each other and judge people immediately by our 
look which is probably not that good but that's what we do and the same thing happens when the examiner looks at your preparation it looks great and it looks beautiful he's probably not gonna look much further into it if you manage to just make an outline of your preparation gorgeous so what's the point if you missed a millimeter or not or if it's a little too deep you obviously have the finesse to make it you know very aesthetically pleasing you have this hand skill and that's exactly what bench test is trying to find out if you have that hand skill or not so if you have some sharp edges on your preparation just put your burr into a very slow rotation most schools right now have electric hand pieces so just bump down those rpms just make it on a very slow surface on a very slow rotations just smooth it out with the same burr it doesn't really matter what you smooth it out realistically just don't make it deeper or wider and if your school does not have an electric your hand piece just take your slow speed do the same thing just smooth it out make sure it's just nice flowing and smooth and the last part that I would like to talk about is those additional elements that some schools really love and I, I've heard schools in California really love dovetails and stuff like that like additional retention elements um, in a filling the retention elements mostly matter when they are done in class 3 and class 4 fillings because we really need that filling to hold on. Um, when it comes to class twos and class ones, adding a dovetail will potentially break you. So sometimes they are those additional grooves that you have to acknowledge uh, because if you don't, they might be a cavity and you missed it. So you kind of like go into them, but don't go too far to create a dovetail because a dovetail is something that has a sharp edge to it and it's never going to look good. It's not going to make your preparation smooth. So I know some schools teach people to do that because it, you know, acknowledges the fissures and uh, gives it additional retention, I guess. But if you're for the purposes of bench test, if you don't do a dovetail, nobody's going to judge you for it. If everything about your preparation is beautiful and you didn't do a dovetail, that's going to be completely okay. But if you messed up a dovetail and you put it there for no reason, that's just going to break you. So I would avoid any additional retention elements like dovetails if you're thinking of making it, in a, if you can make it really, really well, I would honestly still avoid it. Let's just forget about the dovetails. I don't think they bring anything good to preparation. Of course, it's a matter of opinion. We're all different clinicians. We all know what we're doing. So I assume you do too, but I don't, pref I prefer not to do dovetails and I don't recommend you to try it for your first time during your bench test. So I think that is all I wanted to talk about in this this video in my next video stay tuned for that I'm going to show you how I actually prep step by step so definitely subscribe to this channel if you want to see that video happening that's a little harder to set up and I actually wanted to talk about the basic elements first if you want to start practicing for a bench test and you don't know what you have to buy I have a few videos on my setup so I will link one of them down below um, and I would advise you to take a look at that I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you in my future video Bye. Hi, just jumping in here. I'm editing right now and I realized that I forgot to tell you that I, I just launched my brand new website, which I'm super excited about. And the link for that is in the description. And I offer a service now where I check your bench test preparations. You can just send me a picture and we can discuss everything that's good and bad about the prep. If you feel not confident about your preps, please check that out. Uh, all the information is on my new website. Now, goodbye.